good evening, everyone. Uh, I appreciate you coming to uh, the second of our uh, public fact-finding hearing on human trafficking. Uh, this particular hearing is going to be uh, focused on addiction. And, and the reason why uh, we've decided to make this the focus is in our first uh, meeting. We're talking about the, uh, the breadth of human trafficking in the city of Columbus. And uh, one of the um, many things that were talked about, one of them was, a, was the addiction associated with the women that are uh, being human trafficked. And I know Judge Herbert uh, mentioned that the women that become before him in his catch court, you know, 90 plus percent of them have some sort of addiction issue, primarily opiate addiction. Uh, and so I wanted to bring in the experts on addiction. Uh, to talk about what addiction is, how you break someone from that addiction, uh, what treatment, the length of the treatment, the drugs involved. I'm sure there's, it varies on a case-by-case -case basis, but just a general outline of, of what that would look like. And before uh, we begin with our special guests that have come and the experts in the field, um, one, of the, one of the things that I'd like to announce that was identified and talked about in a previous hearing um, was about massage parlors and how those are havens for human trafficking. And we've seen recent busts uh, in Central Ohio of massage parlors where women are being held captive uh, and enslaved at the massage parlors. Um, and we noticed that in our city code, um, in 540.01 of our city code, when we're uh, licensing massage parlors in the city of Columbus, we currently prohibit uh, individuals who have a... Uh, uh, a criminal history or criminal record in prostitution not to own a massage parlor license. And it made sense to us to expand that to also include uh, violations of Ohio Revised Code um, that deal with human trafficking, uh, trafficking in drugs, and then using drugs to corrupt another. Um, so we're going to be, I'm going to be proposing legislation as a, as a result of the first hearing that expands the list of uh, prohibited activity of, of having a of past of, as a consideration for not receiving a permit. So we appreciate everyone's attention to the issue and bringing it to city council. Uh, this wouldn't be done without the partnership with the community of raising um, kind of the situation of specifically in massage parlors and how these women are captive there, uh, that it made sense to expand the definition of, of, some, of something that could prohibit uh, an individual from getting uh, a license license to include if you're you know, a criminal who has been convicted of human trafficking, you're a criminal that's been convicted of drug trafficking, or you've been convicted of using drugs to hold over uh, another, another person to course them to do things. Um, so that will be coming forward in council uh, for consideration over the next couple weeks. Uh, but thank you to our guests. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to uh, Angela Stewart, the Director of Human Resources and Diversity Development at Maryhaven to kick us off. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Angela Stewart, and I'm the Director of Human Resources and Diversity Development at Mary Haven. And Mary Haven is currently working with the Salvation Army to provide comprehensive detoxification services to the victims of human trafficking. And the challenge for Mary Haven is that we run into, uh, we don't have proper funding for the uh, human trafficking victims. And that is because a, a detox bed is around $250 a day for inclusive services. And Mary Haven usually absorbs that cost uh, of the treatment unless they're in Adam H pay. So what we would like to do is get a dedicated funding stream for the human trafficking victims. So $250 a day, mm -hmm. are, are most of these women eligible for Medicaid? Or, or does insurance cover, cover this? Well, um, a lot of times insurance does not cover detox. Um, what happens is we have to, when we bring them in to assess them, it's not enough time to actually get them registered for Medicaid. And if they decide to stay or they're referred to outpatient services or another inpatient services, then there's time to get them registered and we can bill for it. But other than that, if they're in there for their three-day stay or whatever the protocol is, three to seven days, then there's no time to actually get a payer source or anything like that. So, so talk to me about the detoxification process. I mean, it sounds like if you are addicted to heroin, mm -hmm. is three to seven days sufficient? Well, how we treat our uh, human trafficking victims, what we do is we usually get them, you know, dropped off by the Salvation Army or sometimes by the Columbus police, and they come into our engagement center. That is a 24-hour uh, facility that we can take in victims. And so when they come there, we do a slight assessment 
and they will be assessed over at the main office within 24 hours. So then they go through our assessment process and that will determine what their treatment will be. Uh, once they go through that, the assessment process, they're either admitted if, you know, the drug of choice is heroin or whatever. Um, the protocol will be different. You know, we'll use Vivitrol or Suboxone or whatever the protocol is, how much they've been using. They do a full screening on them. And that's going to really determine what the treatment is. But usually our detox is from three to uh, five days. Um, and if they need longer, then we provide them longer. But we also have an ambulatory program where they could come to um, if they needed extended care or even in inpatient. We have a lot of programs that we refer them to at Mary Haven, um, whether it be our um, opiate treatment services or our um, Dan Cannon Hall, which is our residential services. They will continue to get their care and their medication while they're there. At these satellite facilities? No, that's all in Mary all Haven. All at Mary at Haven? And that's all $250, $250 a day? Yes. That, that for the detoxification, that's only for the three to five day stay. Now, if they're referred, you know, if we say, hey, you, you will benefit from our methadone program or our uh, inpatient program, then, you know, then we'll try to get on Medicaid or try to find another paying source. So what's the determination of, the ref of whether someone's referred or not? It depends on their level of usage. It's okay. going to be curtailed to them. Um, whatever they present to us, um, whatever they say that they're on, their drug of choice, that is going to determine what their treatment is. So what's, what's the bed capacity at Mary Haven? Um, for detoxification, mm -hmm. 26. 26 beds? 26 beds. I'm just curious, given the level of usage that you're seeing in the number of women or in men that are maybe involved in the human trafficking sphere, how many beds do you think you need? Is 26 sufficient? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if we build it, they will come. And that's the thing. Um, the sky is the limit. I mean, we have like a waiting list for our services. But what we do for our human trafficking victims is we prioritize them. So whenever they come, we know that they're a human trafficking victim and we get them in within 24 hours. And the beds are always full. Always full. And the, again, the turnaround's three to five days. I'm just trying to wrap my right. head around the, the this. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the turnaround's three to five days. People call in daily because sometimes, you know, some people don't stay as long as their treatment. They say, hey, I'm cured or whatever, and they want to leave. And that's up to them. Um, but sometimes a bit may be open. Um, if they're in dire strait or in need, they'll put a cot out. Um, but we try not to turn anybody away. But there is a waiting list. If we go through a screening process and we determine, hey, you know, it's not dire straits, then what we'll do is, um, you know, put them on a waiting list and they have to wait for the services. And they generally, where do they go back out into society and come back when it's time for them to be treated? That's exactly what happens. Um, they go on the waiting list and when the bed opens, we call down the waiting list and we say the bed is open and can you come? And like 98% of the time they do. Hmm. The drugs that are involved in the detoxification process. Uh, what we use is uh, Vivitrol or Suboxone, um, and we used to use a little bit of methadone. We have a methadone clinic, but that's another protocol, and probably our medical director could speak more on it. Uh, but I do know that uh, Vivitrol and Suboxone were uh, cheaper options, and I think they have less side effects uh, than something like a methadone. Um, and I think that these are short-term use. It's not something that you have to use for a, a, a long stint of time. This is short-term use to get subside. Uh, some of the, the um, side effects that you may have and just help you through your recovery process a little better. Um, and what we do um, with the Vivitrol, their Suboxone, we usually have it there on site, of course, and um, we do watch them take it on a daily. We manage them. We make sure that they take it. And in, in our, um, our opiate treatment program, when people come in and get their dosages, um, some people get them daily. So we just make sure that they are taking their medication as prescribed, and sometimes we have to monitor that. So what's, what's the care that's necessary post three to five days? Uh, post three to five days, what they'll say is, um, you know, depending on your need, a lot of times with the victims of human trafficking where they'll go is to our women's program, which is not located at the main facility. It's located um, in a suburban area out east. And um, that is an extensive program that's about um, nine to 12 months long, and it's for women only, and it curtails to their needs. So if they have children that they would like to get back, if they have children um, that are staying with them, they can stay there to up to age nine. 
Um, and they just do a treatment. So what they would do is have counseling. Um, that's always required when you're taking medication. You can't just take uh, medication without the counseling. So there's always the follow-up. You have to have the counseling piece with it. Um, and then you have group sessions that you're required to attend. Um, and it's all, you know, written out. And a lot of times the way we write our protocol is if you don't get the services, then you won't get the medication. So you have to, we have to keep you engaged. And what's the medication that's that's used in that, that nine to 12 month period? Is it still the same? It's still, it's still oh, the okay. same. Okay. Yeah. And is that something that, that is, that you're always on or is that gradually withdrawn from your system, the Vivitrol and the Suboxone? I think it's gradually withdrawn. I think that's the shorter, it's a shorter stint to the, oh, the methadone. So mm -hmm. the methadone is a longer, a longer term, but these are shorter term. And I do believe that you can kind of uh, taper down from it. Mm -hmm. determined by the doctor. Yes. Got it. And then is this an in, is this inpatient nine to 12 months? Yes. Um, it's a residential facility. And how many beds are there? There are 30, 30 beds there. Um, and what's the cost per day there? At the women's program, um, it's going to vary because it's a residential treatment. So they have different rates. Um, it's probably going to be slightly higher because that's a lot of So services. most of the women there are probably either on private insurance or Medicaid? Medicaid. We have like 99% on Medicaid. And Medicaid, does Medicaid cover this? Yes. Okay. Because it's a treatment facility. Of course. Does Medicaid cover the detoxification? I know you mentioned private insurance likely did not, but does Medicaid? I, that's something that I asked before, and I'm not sure if it does. Okay cover that. And I know that when we get our victims in, it's such a short stint, it's hard to get, you know, even if they do register, they're gone. So. And, and what about the 30 beds? Is it the same thing as far as capacity? Are they always, is it always full? Pretty much. Um, but that I think is a little bit more flexible simply because um, we can tell when somebody, it's a longer term. And what we were talk, discussing just today is um, the user today or the people that are on drugs today, their recovery looks different. And so back in the day, people wanted to go into residential facilities and they, they wanted to stay and, you know, be coddled and get help. And today it's like, if I don't get cured in like, you know, three, four days, I'm, I'm out. I can't. Longer residential, people are not really wanting to do that commitment. Um, they usually want to get in and get out and get about their business. So, um, I think it's easier, believe it or not, to get them into the long-term residential facility than to get them into a detox, um, simply because it's not as high as the demand as the detox is. So from your experience, if we were going to look at solving or doing our part to solve this issue, uh, it sounds to me like a, an immediate investment would be in detox facilities. Correct. Uh, and then secondary would be more into the nine to 12 month process because it sounds like there's capacity there, but if you, we don't have the beds to even get them to the second phase of their recovery, right. then we, uh, we really are doing nothing. We're spinning our wheels. You're correct. Absolutely correct. And I know um, that this is focused on human trafficking, but mm -hmm. just kind of take a step a broader macro step of just opiate addiction generally that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. What's Mary Haven's capacity uh, for, a, for opiate addiction generally? I know we talked about 26 beds for the human trafficking side. Like how many beds are available? Well, um, if you're, I'm sorry. Go, no, please go ahead. <laughs> um, if you're talking about um, detoxification period, that's all this in our detox area. Um, if you're in reference to opiate treatment, we do have an opiate treatment department, but it is not um, an overnight. It's an outpatient. And so the capacity for that, it's like almost 200 because we have the staff, the people, they come in, they take their medications, we monitor them, and it depends on the need if they, you know, have a take-home dosage or if they actually um, will have to come in every day. But um, yeah, just beds in total for detox, it's only 26. 26 total? Yes, not just for human trafficking. Oh, that's just total 26 total. beds. Total. 
seems very minimal. It really is. <laughs> Not just for human trafficking, but just the gravity Period. of the yes. drug problem that I'm hearing about on mm -hmm. kind of the neighborhood level in the city. Uh, and from CPD, who are dealing with crimes, not necessarily crimes mm -hmm. uh, of drug use, but the crimes associated due to drug use, whether it's mm -hmm. breaking into cars, breaking into houses, trying to get extra right. money to, to buy hits. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's a really bad epidemic. And, um, you know, all, only thing we can do, as, as Paul says, Paul Coleman, is, you know, to treat the ones that we have and continue to do our work. But that's, you know, to my comment, um, you build it, they will come, simply because, yeah, we have the capacity, but, you know, right now, I, I think we're, we're doing a capital, you know, campaign to expand, but we're only adding, I think, two more beds or four more beds, I can't remember, but um, it's not like 80. So what would be the way, obviously, if you, you had money growing on trees, you write a check, it's $250 a day, you add 100, 200 beds, and you try to solve this problem. Right. Um, what would the structure look like if you can't use insurance to cover it? All of it would have to be written out of pocket unless you can somehow get folks on Medicaid, if they're Medicaid eligible, mm -hmm. um, for Medicaid to cover the cost, unless you change state law so that insurance is required to cover detoxification. And Adam H. covers some of it. Mm, oh, okay. Want, yeah, Adam, Adam H. helps us out a great deal. They're in Adam Pay. Okay. What percentage do they cover, do you know? I can't tell you that. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, I that's don't okay. know. Okay. The 200 outpatient mm -hmm. opiate treatment center at Mary Haven, is that... Are those 200, does that take in, are the folks that are using that, are they generally folks that have cycled through the detoxification process or could they have found their way to Mary Haven through a different route as well? Yeah, you can just call in. I mean, you don't have to be, you know, detoxed um, because whenever you go to any of our programs, we do a full screening. And so that will determine, you know, our medical director, the doctors will determine what the protocol will be. But um, yeah, you could just, you know, we have people who have jobs and they come in, they get dosed. I think it's open from two, from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. And they come in and get their doses and then they go to work, you know, every day. So, so and I know some of these questions may sound uh, silly and I apologize. Okay. I'm just no, trying no, to no. understand. So folks present themselves at Mary Haven and depending on the level of addiction, they're triaged and some mm -hmm. may be referred to like a detoxification bed if it's that serious or some may be referred to an outpatient and the protocol may determine that things could be done on your own. Here's the treatment plan. It just dep depends on the unique circumstances. Yes. Uh, and exactly. so just so I'm clear, the numbers that you're seeing that involve a severe addiction that would yield a detoxification monitored process are increasingly growing. So the mm -hmm. 26 beds in itself are insufficient. Correct. Okay. Okay. You're Thank correct. you. All right, I may come back with more questions as they pop in my head, okay. but I, I really appreciate that, that overview. It was very educational. No problem. Um, so, Ms. Hochstetler? Good evening, and thank you. Good evening, and thank you for inviting Alvis House to testify before this panel. Uh, my name is Lois Hochstetler. I'm the Managing Director of Clinical Services at Alvis House. Alvis is a nonprofit human services agency that was founded in 1967 with the goal of helping individuals learn new skills and behaviors and turn their lives around. We have two service lines. The first is reentry services for individuals and families with criminal justice involvement, and number two is services for individuals with developmental disabilities. Tonight I'd like to talk about human trafficking and the Alvis CHAT program, which serves women who have become involved in human trafficking. CHAT is an acronym that stands for Changing Habits, Attitudes, and Thoughts. CHAT addresses the needs of women who are victims of human trafficking and have drug and or alcohol addiction. Program participants are referred by the catch court specialty docket of the Franklin County Municipal Court. Women who participate in the catch court have multiple arrests for prostitution. Most of the women are victims of child sexual and or physical abuse. Abuse at home leads to juvenile runaways. Judge Paul Herbert of the catch court specialty docket reports that 96% of human trafficking victims started out running away from home, often to escape abuse. Drug abuse, childhood victimization, runaway behavior, and economic necessity can all be pathways into prostitution for trafficking victims. 
Addiction can predate or be a result of prostitution, but it is a factor in keeping women involved. The understanding of prostitution as a form of human trafficking has evolved rapidly over the last few years. The idea of prostitution as the world's oldest profession or a victimless crime is being transformed into an understanding of prostitution as a business of criminal sexual exploitation. The Federal Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 defines human trafficking as the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for one of three purposes. Labor or services involving the use of fro force, fraud, or coercion, a commercial sex act through the use of force, fraud, or con coercion, or any commercial sex act if the person is under 18 years of age. Leaving prostitution successfully depends upon the ability to develop financial support and work through the burdens of stigma, addiction, and resolution of emer emotional boundaries. Studies stress that when working with women who are attempting to leave prostitution, it is important to identify the developmental phase and to target interventions appropriately. Studies of the specific exit strategies used by prostituted women found that formal support services, including residential treatment, safe housing, and individual and group counseling, and personal commitment to change were necessary during the initial exit stage. Relationships are important in leaving or re-entering prostitution. Family, partners, and children were positive forces in women's ability to exit. Former buyers, drug dealers, pimps, and other prostituted women were, not surprisingly, detrimental to women's ability to successfully exit. The ability to earn a legal living wage was paramount to sustained exit from prostitution, and financial hardship was a primary reason for women to re-enter prostitution. Trafficked women often suffer from complex trauma, which is repeated and intrusive trauma that involves a significant amount of shame and stigma. Treatment must be trauma-informed in order to effectively help these women recover. The Alvis Chat program was developed based on the professional literature about women's experiences of prostitution, the professional literature about evidence-based treatment for women and exiting prostitution, and the combined experience of the project's partners, Alvis, Amethyst, and Southeast, in treating women referred from the catch court and working with court personnel. The CHAP program began in, in November 2013 and has three major areas of focus. The first is safe housing, also is clinical treatment for substance abuse, trauma, and mental health issues. And third is comprehensive support services, including case management, physical health, and vocational. Alvis provides safe housing, peer support, case management services, and vocational services. Amethyst provides clinical services. Southeast provides physical and mental health services. CHAT is designed as a two-year program that coincides with the length, length of the Catch Court program. Upon completion of the Catch Court program, women can continue to receive aftercare services at Alvis House or Amethyst for as long as needed. CHAT provides housing for up to 15 clients at any given time. Depending on their clinical needs, clients may be transitioned into other housing in the community after nine to 12 months. Each client will move through treatment and privileges at her own pace, provided based on her individual plan. In the two years since opening, the chat house has served a total of 30 women. We currently have 10 women in the house, six of whom are employed, and three of whom are ready to complete the program when appropriate housing is found. I would like to thank City Council once again for holding this hearing. Alvis is happy to lend its support to providing education about, development and improvement of treatment programs for, for vulnerable populations in the city of Columbus. At Alvis House, we are proud to be an agent of change. We know the services we provide have been proven to reduce the risk that an individual will return to the criminal justice system. That's good for them, their families, and for our whole, whole community. Thank you for sharing that. And, and to, you are primarily dealing with or it sounds like solely dealing with women in catch. Correct. Okay. And which obviously is an internationally renowned program and what Judge Herbert has created there is a model for a lot of cities to follow. I'm particularly concerned about the women that aren't eligible 
for catch because maybe they screened and they're not ready to enter the catch court. Um, do you have any thoughts on what we could be doing as a society to address those women instead of just churning and burning them through the, in, the criminal justice system, uh, repeating offenses, putting them back out on the street into the heinous situation we just pulled them from? Uh, because I, I'm particularly disturbed about that uh, just from a criminal justice societal standpoint because it's not true criminal justice for turning these women into that situation. Um, so what do we do for the non-catch women? What do you have any thoughts? Well, I think we look at things more broadly for anyone involved in the criminal justice system. Um, we have two halfway houses for women involved in the criminal justice system, and while they have entered typically for other crimes, a significant number of them have been convicted of prostitution. Uh, Judge Herbert, I've heard the statistic many times, is that 92% of the women that come through his court with charges of prostitution meet the definition for human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So if we kind of extrapolate that, we know that the women that we're working with at Alvis House that are involved in the justice system um, also have histories of prostitution and criminal or, and um, human trafficking. So one of the things we do is we take that into consideration. We offer trauma groups. Um, we offer cognitive behavioral programming. So we provide things that we know that will make a difference. So these are women that we're hoping to keep from slipping through the cracks. Um, by presenting things um, in trauma-informed ways, we can reach a broader um, group of women that haven't necessarily been identified in the past. So what do we do with the women, though, if, if so, here, like, you, you base, base the, the subsets in the, of what we know. 92% have human trafficking criteria. 90-plus percent have some sort of addiction. Um, how, how do we marry this the services of a detoxification process with the wraparound services that you're providing through Amethyst and Southeast and Alvis House into a comprehensive package, which we're doing in a lot of ways for the catch women, but how can we expand that to the women who aren't eligible or ready to do catch? Because if we're just returning them onto the street with an addiction into the situation we're in, that's not criminal justice in my opinion. Right. Um, so how can we create an atmosphere where they have the opportunity for detoxification? Uh, because how can you make clear choices if you're on drugs, or, or especially the levels of, of addiction we're talking about, to give them a chance to get a clarity of mind so that they can choose their own path or destiny? Do, do either of you have any thoughts about that? Because that's something that troubled me from the first hearing, right. is, is, is hearing the fact that, okay, so we, we, we arrest these women, we spend $5.4 million a year on incarceration, 90 plus percent of whom have, have uh, addiction, 90 plus percent of whom have evidence of human trafficking, throw them in jail for three, you know, one to three days, it costs us $5.4 million, uh, and then the 1,900 plus that aren't eligible for catch go back on the street, and the ones that are eligible, the small number that we are saving, get a chance to get a rehabilitation, a chance for a new life. That's great. And we should continue to fund that. And I will be an advocate to fund that. But what about the other 1,900? I think that it's going to take partnerships. I think that, you know, communication and partnerships, um, like we're working with the Salvation Army right now because they actually go out on the street to find these victims. And um, we work with the Columbus the Police Department to try to find the victims. I think it's going to take a network of people to try to help those to catch the people who are out there who can't get into catch court and it, to build those relationships to say, okay, um, let's all meet up, you know, you do the detoxification, you do the residential treatment, um, and you go find them. So I think it's, it's going to take partnerships, but again, you also have to have the funding for that. You know, if someone isn't, if, who's, who's paying the people, you know, for this uh, cohort? Who, who's paying, you know, for the um, partnership? So I think that more of that is needed. And I think that that's a great start. And, you know, hopefully, you know, you can look at that and maybe expand a certain model. Um, I know that in Delaware, they had started doing that. They had Mary Delaware Haven. County or Delaware yeah, State? Delaware, Delaware County. Okay. Um, they had uh, Mary Haven in the room because we're in Mary Haven, I mean in uh, Delaware. They had Mary Haven, they had the police department. Um, they had different um, facilities in there that would help these victims. And we all sat down, got together and said, okay, this is your part, this is what we're gonna do. So I, I think that that's one answer. I don't know if it's the answer, but I think more of that is what's needed 
in order to at least put a dent in it. And do you feel at, is, is the base of the solution detoxification? Can, can, can you do anything else unless you are, you can break your, or at least take steps to break your addiction? I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you, you. Detox is obviously a critical piece, um, and that sometimes deters people from getting into treatment because that first you know, week or so is very rough. Um, the reality of it is, this is not the pretty side, um, I will tell you, but detox happens all the time in the county jail. Mm -hmm. So it is not a pleasant thing to go through, um, but it does happen. So people do get through that. The women that come to our program have honestly, have generally detoxed in the jail before they come to us. So while that is a very significant piece, that's only the tip of the iceberg. That gets them through the very initial cravings. Um, what's really needed is the ongoing treatment if you're gonna make a difference. Just getting them through those few couple of days, if you don't have treatment, if you don't have a way for them to really make a change in terms of, of wanting to be um, free from substances, they're just gonna keep cycling again and all you're gonna do is fund detox, fund detox, fund detox. That ha that's a very important piece, but it's not the only piece. Hmm. Okay. And that's why there's comprehensive services, you know, exactly. when you the wrap around the wrap around services, services mm -hmm. that you provide. Okay. Is there anything else that I should be thinking about or you want to provide information to? I know we were talking about over a thousand women, um, but on a small scale, we have looked at our program. Um, Adam funds it. I, did, I guess I'd forgotten to mention that piece um, hmm. and have been generous with the funding for the chat house. Um, we had agreed for the initial two-year period that it was only going to serve individuals that came through catch court. Um, we did say that after that time with continued funding that if we weren't maxed out on the number of clients that we could serve, we would look to see about the possibility of taking women who didn't come through catch court. We haven't, that we're just coming up on our two years now. Um, I don't want to speak for Adam, I don't want to, but we have had extra capacity. So that could be something that we could explore if there were other individuals that were survivors of human trafficking and wanted to voluntarily to want okay. the treatment. That's good to know. And that would be covered, uh, you know, in the in the the fees that are already being provided by Adam. So that wouldn't take any extra money. Sure. Okay. Great. Anything else? Okay. Thank you all. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Uh, this is an education opportunity, not only for the folks that are watching, for me. Uh, this is a sphere that I. I want to join hands with Judge Herbert, who has made strides in this field, and join hands with y'all who are dealing with these issues. And I applaud the effort uh, that you're doing. And, I, and there's a clearly more work to do. Uh, and I think more work to do generally in addiction and detoxification services uh, in this county for men and women, whether they're victims of human trafficking or not, uh, just because of the amount of resources it's taking from uh, CPD, the criminal issues that's going on in our neighborhoods that are quality of life issues, and how they're affecting directly families from all walks of life. It doesn't matter if you're male or female, rich or poor, that you know, drug addiction can affect a family, you know, no matter how much money you make or where you live. Uh, so I thank you for, for educating me and taking the time uh, to do this. Uh, that concludes the hearing uh, for this evening. Uh, thank you to our uh, two experts in the field. And I look forward to our continued partnership uh, as we try to figure this out uh, together. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.